tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. From the 49th verse of the 24th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Why, you might wonder at the start, is the text not taken from the Epistle or Gospel or first or second lesson any of the readings for today. There's a reason. The book of Acts, second chapter, where it describes the descent of the Holy Ghost upon the apostles, says that they were all together in one place. And that's get the words in front of us here exactly. They were all with one accord in one place. Now, what I would like to know is in what spirit or attitude were they in one accord? in that one place. And I think that the only way we can find out what spirit and attitude they gathered in is to look at what Jesus told them to do. Because it doesn't say in that reading what spirit it was in which they were all in one accord. What were they doing there all in one accord? And that's why we have this text, tarry ye, tarry. It's an old English word that means wait around. It doesn't just mean wait, but it means wait around. It means really, really wait. Wait around, tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued. That's a fancy foreign word that means provided with or gifted with, given, provided with power from on high. So at Pentecost, the disciples tarried at Jerusalem looking to be given the power from the Spirit above. There's another verse that also connects with this, and it sheds more light on it. And this is Jesus again, Jesus' own words. And there in the eighth verse of the first chapter of the book of Acts, and he says this to them, Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Well, what does that mean? They were tarrying in Jerusalem waiting for the Spirit because they had yet no power. They were without power. They were powerless. They were helpless. And they were there because he told them to wait until they were empowered by the Spirit, which was his doing, not theirs. They weren't there to get a blessing. They weren't there for any purpose other than to obey his words. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And he said, tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued, provided with power from on high. So now you and I are his disciples and we're coming to him with one accord. At least we're here today with one accord. In what spirit? to receive power from above, not to exert or express our own inherent power or our own inherent righteousness. We would have no need to come together for that. We could stay home and be happy and proud of ourselves. We have power. We have all that we need. But we come here recognizing a need to receive his power from above. So this is a humbling experience a humbling experience to come to God in obedience to his words, waiting to be empowered by his spirit. And the spirit did come with wind and fire, with a great testimony of his presence. In the first days of the gospel, it was more evident that the gospel was genuine and real because God provided external signs to prove it to the outsiders and to many even of the faithful who weren't sure if they were on the right track. Those helps were necessary. It was kind of, you might say, a boost at the beginning to get things started. 
They don't have to be happening today. You don't have to see flames of fire on other people's heads to know that the spirit indwells them. The spirit itself responds to the spirit in other people because it's one and the same spirit that indwells all. And that's what we're pursuing here. How to acquire that, how to come near to God and receive that power. The first thing, obviously, is to recognize that we're empty, we're powerless, we're waiting for his spirit. This is the greatest central truth for Christians. All power, all power, all power is in God and belongs to God. All power is in his spirit. All power is in his word. All power is in the blood of his redeem redeeming death on the cross for us. Fallen nature turns around and says the opposite. It says, no, no, you have power. Well, I have power in myself and so do you. But Jesus says, tarry, wait, wait a while. Do nothing of your own. Wait for God to act. That's a hard lesson. The world won't receive that lesson. The only way the apostles, the disciples received it is because they had come to love Jesus already. And so they followed him in trust. If I love him any, in any degree, whatever, in any way, whatever, I will do what he says. I will tarry. I will wait until I'm given his power. I will not rely on my power. Why? Because if I rely on my power, it's all wrong. It's all self-centered. It's not God's word. It's not his truth. It's not his gospel. It's my self-will. It's my self-approval and my self-satisfaction, my self-justification. It's all a dead-end street in self. You can't get rid of self except by stopping and waiting and coming empty-handed and letting him be the power in you and do the work in you. Even one of the verses that we sang in one of the hymns just now was, where thou art not, man hath not, nothing good in deed or thought, nothing free from taint of ill. Quite true. Even the 19th century hymn writer could say that. But it wasn't a 19th century hymn writer, by the way. That was a medieval Latin hymn translated in the 19th century. But there it is. For centuries, Christians have understood that if we come with our own will and our own satisfaction and our own preparedness and readiness and self-approval, we have nothing good in deed or thought nothing free from taint or ill because it is not putting God first or anybody else first it's putting self first you can see the reason is self evident so Jesus because he tells us to the, this to his followers and to all the world is an offense to all the world they don't want to hear that they are empty and that standing alone they are only evil and are lost and that they can only receive good and power from without, from above, from his spirit dwelling in them. They don't want to hear that because they're downright determined that they're going to find goodness in themselves. That's the fight between Christ and the world and between Christ and all other religions in the world. They all appeal to what you can do and get a reward for it. Now, I'm not a student of all the religions of the world, but with whatever superficial contact you have with them shows you that that's what's going on there. They have a set of rules, and if you keep them, then Allah is merciful, and God will provide his mercies and blessings. You just have to keep his rules. If you do, you have earned his blessings. That's the nature of all religions. And tragically, tragically, many Christian leaders have tried to make Christianity into the same kind of thing, reducing it to a set of rules and formalities 
the compliance with which makes you feel self-righteous and therefore entitled to the redemption and the blessings of heaven. And there are many Christians that live from cradle to grave with exactly that religion in their heart. I'm keeping all the rules. I know all the formalities and ceremonials. I know all, all of the commandments. I know everything. I can recite it off the tip of my tongue. So can the devil. And because I do this, I'm going to heaven. And if you can't do it, you're not. And as so as such has been the underlying drift of so many religious wars, as well as many other wars, a self-righteousness built on self-confidence in self-performance. All that's on its head come Whitson Day. Jesus says, come together and tarry. Don't do anything. Wait. Put everything aside and wait. And I'll give you the power. And that's where your power will come from. From beginning to end, from now and forever, they'll have no other source but my spirit in you. Period. Check it out. This self-righteous theory of religion that the world teaches, and that so many Christians even have fallen into, stumbled into, teaches you to be strong in yourself. It teaches the people to be strong in self. But Jesus, when he says, tarry until you are empowered from on high, is doing the opposite. He's saying, you are empty in yourself. You have nothing in yourself that I want. You are a temple. You are a receptacle. You must wait until I fill you. And you can only be filled with my spirit. Now you can fill your heart with evil spirits, with self-centeredness, but they don't belong there. That's like a usurper on the throne. It doesn't belong there. And you're in bondage as long as that condition exists. But if you listen to him, you are not one of those led astray by the worldly thinking that I am strong in myself. I'm not strong in myself. I have nothing but Jesus and his word, his spirit, his blood of redemption. And therefore, I have his power. And therefore, alone, I have all that makes me strong. Let's examine some scriptures on this. The character in which Christ tells us to be is one that he said earlier to his disciples in Luke 12:35. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord. Not men that are self-confident and go forward and put everybody in their place and say, I have it all figured out. No, be like men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding. That when he cometh and knocketh, they may open to him. Immediately, knowing that their hearts are empty until he fills them. You see, that's what he said in verses 35 and 36 of 12, in chapter 12 of Luke. Blessed are those whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. And he makes promises of how great things they will receive for being in a state of watching. Psalm 75, even in the Old Testament. Verse 3 says, in the appointed time, says God, I will judge according to right. People look at the world's affairs today and say they're in such a mess. I could straighten this out. Just give me an army and I'll make sure everything is straightened out. There's so much of that going on. It only adds to the chaos. God says, in the appointed time, I shall judge according to right. And we must give him all the prerogatives of judgment. Psalm 74 says, For God is my king of old, the help that is done upon earth. He doeth it himself. The doings and the straightening out and the righteousness that's done on earth, God does it, not individual people by their will. Isaiah 64 says this, For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the hearing of the ear, nor hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. There's that word again, wait. 
tarry. Even back in Isaiah, it was there. The reward, unspeakable reward, that has never even entered into anybody's imagination, is so great, is for those who wait for him. Don't assert themselves, but wait. We go to him waiting, acknowledging his power, and he has unspeakably great gifts prepared for us. Genesis 41, 6, Joseph, another Old Testament character, Joseph. Amazing. In his day, there was never any Bible in existence, much less Ten Commandments or law or anything like that. But he knew this much about God. He knew that he was to wait for God and that what God did through him was not his own. They said, uh, Pharaoh said to him, I hear you can interpret dreams. And Joseph said to him in Genesis 4, 41, 16, it is not in me, even though he knew that he had already previously had interpreted dreams successfully for people. When Pharaoh said, I hear you can interpret dreams, he said, it's not in me. God does, does this and he can do it for you. Excellent statement. The power is in God, not in ourselves. And he visits us from time to time as he will with his power. And it is his spirit working that enables a good deed to be done through us. It is not to our credit, but to his. Put things in their proper sequence. In Acts 3, 12, Peter healed a lame man who was at one of the gates of Jerusalem. After this day of uh, Whitsunday with the descent of the Holy Ghost upon the people, and they were boldly preaching in Jerusalem, and the Pharisees were much upset about it. And as he came into the city, there was a lame man that had been lame all his life and sitting there at the same gate begging all his life long. And, and Peter saw him and healed him. And he rose up and was praising the Lord, and strong on his feet, leaping, dancing. And then Peter said to the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? This is Acts 3, 12. Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man walk? And then in verse 16, he says, In his name, Jesus' name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong. And then he said he testified the same way to the Pharisees that questioned him about it. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom he crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Even though it was Peter who did the deed, he claimed none of the credit. He put it all on Christ. The Pharisees were doing the opposite. Jesus said when they convert anybody to their religion, he says in Matthew 23, 15, you make that person twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. How is it? In Matthew 23, 28, you appear outwardly to be righteous, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. If you appear outwardly to be righteous in your own doings, as the Pharisees did, you are inwardly motivated by self-centeredness and by pride. You're not worshiping God at all. You're just promoting your, yourself. There are good Christians that know this, and you've seen them, and I have too. Knew one that was a good friend, a hunting companion, a person you spend a lot of time with in the wilderness on treks and hard times, and they tell you a lot of things about their life when you're out there. But one of the things I found out about this hunting companion a long time ago was, and he never told me a word about this, I found it out later, that he was the currently published author of a series of wilderness adventure articles. That he was at that time writing and publishing in a publication that I was unaware of. He never mentioned a word of it to me. And we shared these wilderness experiences and values, and he knew that I would be interested in that. But why didn't he tell me about it? 
because it would be too much like self-promoting to do that. To say, by the way, I've written some articles that are being published right now, such and such, go look for it. He didn't say that at all. I never knew it. It never came from his mouth. And he's long since gone to his eternal reward. I found out later, because I stumbled upon this, these publications. And when I did, I snapped up all the copies I could find, back issues and all, because the articles were so good. All of Wilder's adventures. Good reading, though. But that's the kind of thing that a Christian is supposed to be doing. He's not digging into his background to find things that he can boast about to others. Even just tell them as a story with his, the, the un, unspoken but genuine foundation of which being, see how great and good I am that I did this? No. If there was a possibility of interpreting that, 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 the story that way, he withheld the story. He wouldn't share with me even something that I would have been glad to know because it was too much like putting himself forward and bragging. I have more respect after the fact for the saintly self-effacement and Christian humility of that man than I ever realized at the time that we were companions on hunting trips. Didn't know it, but there it is. And that's the kind of thing that God says he wants from us, from you and me. We're to hide our accomplishments, not to spread them in front of people because you're only spreading them in front of people to get their admiration, to get them to agree with you. Isn't that great of me? Right? That's what we do. That's human nature. I don't have to go into all the examples of it, but that's true. It's what it is. But I'll never forget a Christian put away a real treasure because to share it would have been like boasting and he didn't want to risk that. Good man, excellent beyond words. We will never hear Christ's call to repentance if we always recall our own cleverness and justify our own deeds. Even Hymn writers tell us this, hymn 58 says this, Grant my soul may wear the lowliest garb of penitence and prayer. Thou wilt answer for me, righteous Lord. When we come to God, we should empty our souls of everything but love for him. And do you know something? That's how we should approach one another. Not forcing our will upon others or our personality or our ideas or our thoughts or whatever, just monopolizing their attention. But come to them, humble, ready to put them first. Ready to put them first. And the Spirit will be with you in that. Because it's the Spirit's work. Hymn 60 says, Christ and his cross, my only plea. To Calvary alone I flee. God be merciful to me. I don't have anything that I can put before God as justifying me. I have nothing. I'm not even going to try. Some people say, well, you have a lot to be proud of. Well, you have, you've done a lot. You should be proud of it. No, I'm not going to put any of that on the table. None of it. All of it just goes behind me. I'll hear none of that. I won't listen to you. I have nothing. If there's any good, God did it. What did we quote that verse just a little while ago? The good that is done in the, on earth, he doeth it himself. If there was any good done, it was God in me that did it. It was not I. Peter, I didn't heal these people. God in me did. God healed them. Jesus Christ did. This is Christianity, my friends. And the world wants nothing to do with it. It wants self-assertion self-promoting hates Christ for saying humble yourself come empty let me fill you my spirit will do in you great and wonderful things that you know not that belong to God do you know we've looked at this before but it's worth remembering the Trinity itself the persons of the Trinity never talk of themselves they always talk of the other members of the Trinity and we have this in 
John's Gospel, fifth chapter mostly. John 22, 23, Jesus says, The Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment to the Son. Verse 23, why? So that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Now there's an answer to people to say, there's something wrong with the Christian religion. God has no Son. Jesus says, if you don't honor the Son as you honor the Father, you dishonor the Father and you don't have him either. You can't have the Father without the Son. It doesn't, there is no such religion. And the Father honors the Son in front of all the world by committing all judgment to the Son because he wants the Son to receive honor as the Father himself does. You see the outgoingness of it? And the Son promotes the Father by saying this about him. And the Son says of himself, I can do nothing of myself but what I see the Father do. All things he does, the Son doeth likewise, John 5.19 and 5.30, I can of myself do nothing. He says, I'm not bragging about what I do. It's God in me that does these things. Just like Peter said, you thought I healed that person. No, it was God that healed them. And Jesus himself says, it is God in me. I can do nothing of myself. Imagine the Son of God saying that. But he did. God does not brag. He puts the honor on the other person in the Trinity, on his Father. He's the one that did this. He committed judgment to me, yes, but I don't judge according to my will. I judge according to his will. He gives up the judgment that the Father gave him, gives it back to him by judging in accordance with what the Father wants. Not because the Father is over there glaring at him and requiring it, but as an act of love and honor between them. And in John 16, Jesus says to his disciples, when the spirit of truth is come, this is verses 13 and 14, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. He shall glorify me and show the things of me to you and all things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and show it to you. The Spirit shall not speak of himself. So neither the Father glorifies himself, but he honors the Son. The Son can do nothing of himself, but he honors the Father. And the Spirit shall not speak of himself. There it is, John 16, 13. He shall not speak of himself. Why is it human beings love to speak of themselves and wait and look for search for out opportunities to speak of themselves? and do it impliedly, if not directly. Occupy your attention about something that I'm good at because I'm showing you how good I am. I mean, don't we do this all the time, friends? I'll not belabor the point, it's there. Are we better than God himself that we should be allowed to boast him? Dear God, our Father, Enable us to grasp the, thy meaning in the great deeds thou didst on this first Whitson day. That all we have and hope for are in thy power, the power and the gifts that thou hast ready to bestow on us when we but tarry thy leisure. That's another one out of the Psalms, tarry thou the Lord's leisure. Loving thee and trusting thee alone, thy spirit Thy word, thy son's blood shed in death for us. Enable us to love thee enough to put out of our hearts every trace of self-trust and self-praise because thou art faithful and true and hast prepared for all who truly love thee such good things as are far beyond all that we would hope or could even pray for. In thy son Jesus Christ's sake, and in his name we pray. Amen.